Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to join today's event, Climate Risk in Action, a conversation with practitioners. Last November, the HKMA and the International Finance Corporation jointly launched the Alliance to help banks develop the solutions necessary to encourage commercial banks in Asia to adopt strategies and targets to become greener. Today, the Alliance is hosting the third roundtable on climate risk. This roundtable aims to equip participants across the region with basic knowledge related to climate risk and provide a platform for market influencers across banks, financial institutions, insurers, rating agencies, and thought leaders to share their first-hand experiences and intelligence. Today, we're delighted to have Mr. Peter Cashin, Chief Investment Officer and the Global Head of Climate Finance for Financial Institutions Group at the IFC to deliver opening remarks, followed by a keynote speech by Ms. Pratima Diffie, Regional Director of CDP Hong Kong. After that, there will be a roundtable discussion moderated by Daryl Ho, Executive Director, Banking Policy of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. Participants are welcome to pose questions for the floor Q&A sessions. Before we start, we would like to take this opportunity to thank the China Banking Association and its Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Pan, for their support of the Alliance. We greatly appreciate the zealous support CBA has offered to the Alliance knowledge sharing initiatives in green finance to banks and financial institutions in China. Thank you. To kick off the round table, may I invite Peter to deliver the opening remarks. Peter, please. Good morning and good afternoon to our distinguished guest speakers and audience joining across Asia and the globe. My name is Peter Cashin. I'm the head of climate finance and chief investment officer for the Global Financial Institutions Group at the IFC. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you today to today's webinar on Climate Risk, a Conversation with Practitioners, hosted by IFC's Alliance for Green Commercial Banks in partnership with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. It's the latest event in a series of three webinars to address climate risk issues. In this roundtable, panelists will reveal their firsthand experiences and efforts in addressing climate-related risks as well as upcoming challenges. Now, in terms of some risks and opportunities, there's really a growing awareness of climate risk, and this has galvanized regulators to take action in recent years. Addressing climate risks, together with the capability to measure and disclose, has then become a critical aspect for financial institutions. The Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, TCFD, divides climate-related risks into two major categories, physical risk and transition risks. Physical risks arise from climate and weather-related events, which can result in financial loss and impaired asset value for financial institutions. For example, the risk of a significant drop in grain yields and damage to capital stock from flooding will double by 2030. And this will increase the result, this will increase risks and balance sheet risks. Transition risk stems from the process of transitioning to a low carbon economy. The UN estimates the cost of adapting to climate change could be up to 500 billion US dollars per year globally. Disruptive physical impacts will give rise to transition risks and at the same time create new opportunities in the economy. For example, as countries increasingly reduce their dependency on finite fossil fuels, it has also created a new investment opportunity for renewable energy and electric vehicles. July 2021 was the hottest month on record in human history. As temperatures continue to rise, it is imperative for banks to manage both the risks and opportunities effectively. Banks increasingly understand what expectations are being put upon them, but getting there will not be easy. While banks can control their own policies and actions, they have limited control over the actions of their clients. At times, banks have been scrutinized for contributing to climate change by funding fossil fuel projects, although they have been redirecting their activities toward climate-friendly ventures. 
As one of the largest reserves managers globally, at IFC, we embrace responsible investing by helping banks manage their climate-related physical and transition risk associated with these projects and the businesses that they are funding. We do this by developing a common assessment framework to help banks to assess their individual greenness baseline. We are seeing banks working to develop the data models, analytical tools, and approaches needed to assess their clients' environmental impact. But this is a learning process. They need to step up their efforts to assess how their lending decisions affect their own risks and profitability, in addition to the efforts to assess their clients' contribution to climate risk. Looking at the issue through both lenses helped to bring the focus and importance closer to the business agenda of the institution, rather than just viewing it as a regulatory effort. So in closing, I hope that many of you here today will find this discussion useful and insightful. And please stay tuned for the upcoming topics on this events on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Now may I invite Pratima to deliver the keynote speech. Pratima, please. Good morning and thank you, Susanna. It is a pleasure to be here and very much appreciate Daryl for the kind invite to speak at this session. The fact that we're gathered here today to discuss on climate-related disclosures, to me, shows how very far we have come since the Paris Agreement, and the numbers speak for themselves. Over 2,000 companies globally today have committed to science-based decarbonization targets. 75% of S&P 500 responds to climate-related frameworks, such as the TCFD. And this is evident from the high reporting rates that we are actually seeing on our own platform. And over 200 multinational organizations are engaging with their suppliers to identify climate challenges and opportunities within their supply chains. All of this corporate action is enthusiastically being met by the financial sector. There is high expectation that the green bond market will hit or exceed a trillion dollars by 2022. In some markets, such as Hong Kong and Singapore, which have declared their ambitions to become the green finance centers for Asia and globally, regulators and policymakers have already begun to announce and implement roadmaps and policies to prepare companies for this transition. All this encouraging news however, comes with two very sobering facts. The first is that despite this momentum in green finance, our data shows that global fund assets, which are aligned to the Paris Agreement, is less than 1% of total assets. The second sobering fact is that the world is going to hit another record high in greenhouse gas emissions in 2021. The question we therefore need to ask ourselves is how are we seeing the growth of sustainable finance leading to genuine mitigation of climate change and environmental destruction? And this question is important because the answer will influence the success of green and sustainable finance. To strengthen our response to climate challenges, I have identified key areas of priority for the financial sector, noting, of course, that there are obstacles in the path. And to borrow the phrase, we are trying to build this plane as we are flying it. The first and foremost is the conversion of climate information that is easily interpretable into financial impact, negative or positive. We need a list of climate finance ratios, which then help us to develop a common understanding, firstly, of the financial value of a mitigation or adaptation activity. And the second that we need is the benchmarking of these climate ambitions against sector averages and Paris alignment. 
Some tools exist today to deliver on these. For example, the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, or PCAF, as it is commonly known, which was founded by a group of Dutch financial institutions, has a great starting point on six asset classes on the calculation of financed emissions. Another example is the temperature ratings methodology by WWF and my organization, which translates a company's emissions reduction target into a single temperature score, which then allows us to easily see how close or far a reduction target is in line with the Paris goals. These financial ratios are still emerging, and there needs to be a rapid scaling of such tools methodologies, and standards for the effective growth of green and sustainable finance. It goes without saying that accurate measurement and reporting of portfolio-related emissions will be key to financial decision-making. The second priority should be a need to default to transparency and ensure high accountability in sustainable finance transactions. The growth of sustainable finance will depend on bankable projects that are verifiable. And overwhelming data on sustainability today is voluntary and not necessarily verified or audited by third parties. This, as you can imagine, hugely limits the ability of putting sustainability data to financial use. Mandatory reporting is, of course, of paramount importance, and governments across the world are working on this. But we also need interim solutions as governments support and help companies in the run-up to mandatory reporting. So what could these interim solutions be? As a starting point, financial institutions could start requesting third-party verification of operational emissions for companies in high-impact sectors. On stewardship, financial institutions could co consider engaging with their portfolio companies on not just climate resilience, but also decarbonization. As a first port of call, an assessment of how resilient a business's operations are to climate change is needed to assess financial risk. Decarbonization targets are then needed to be built into these resilience assessments. This sounds obvious, of course, but I specifically stress this point because we are seeing companies globally making net zero announcements without first conducting a full risk evaluation under climate-related financial disclosure frameworks, or they're focusing purely on risk mitigation without considering the opportunities that will come with low carbon transition. Monitoring of climate strategies of these investments will help companies adopt the right approaches to transition. On the point of decarbonization, uncertainties currently exist. The first is, of course, our collective need to arrive at pricing ranges for emissions and at treatment of emissions during a company's transition to net zero. Presently, there is no standard way to measure, report, and verify carbon removal. And in the absence of such standards, financial institutions could perhaps begin engaging with their investments to see if they have internal carbon pricing policies in place and how carbon pricing models are being implemented in their business operations. For example, our database shows approximately 800 companies in Asia today actively considering internal carbon pricing strategies or intending to do so in the next two years. Data points such as these will provide strong guidance to financial institutions on how companies are assessing climate transition and considering mitigation measures. And finally, 
It is well acknowledged today that climate change is a systemic, undiversifiable risk. From this perspective, an urgent priority for us today is to shift our mindset that green and sustainable finance is a separate asset class. We will not be able to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change by segmenting sustainable finance as an opportunistic investment strategy. For us to collectively meet our goals of the Paris Agreement, all finance needs to be sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's move on to the panel discussion session today. Uh, Peter and Pratima actually mentioned a few times that the importance of the addressing climate challenge, and this is one of the most pressing challenges facing the world today. And in recent years, we have seen increasing frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, including flooding and wildfires. Uh, in Hong Kong, you know, for those audience that uh, you know, based in Hong Kong, you actually has just experienced the hottest September with an average temperature of 29.7 uh, degrees Celsius. And there were actually 15 very hot days and 11 very hot nights in the month, both marking new records for September in Hong Kong. To address these, climate, uh, uh, these uh, extreme weather events arising from climate change, we need substantial reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Otherwise, global warming will exceed 1.5 and even 2 degrees Celsius during the 21st century. Now, the round table today comes at the perfect timing. Uh, the COP26 reminds us that the financial sector can make significant contribution to addressing climate change. You remember that the Paris Agreement aims to make financial flows consistent with a pathway towards low greenhouse gas emission and climate resilient development. And one of the key emphasis of COP26 is to also to mobilize climate finance to drive the transition of the real economy towards net zero by 2050. But the key question is how? What sort of tools are needed to help financial firms to deliver these goals? Uh, one example is taxonomy. Taxonomy plays an important role in help driving financial flows towards green activities. How shall financial firms manage multiple taxonomies across different parts of the world and use these activity-based classification systems to facilitate their lending decisions or asset allocation decisions, which are often entity-based? And where are the gaps and how to address those gaps, including the data gaps? For instance, in Hong Kong, financial regulators will mandate uh, financial firms as well as listed companies to make TCFD disclosure before 2025. Is it enough to create the data needed of, uh, for addressing climate risk and managing climate risk by the financial firms? Financial regulators in Hong Kong are already working very hard together to address these challenges, trying to build a green ecosystem here we strive to develop a green bond market by building a large uh, green government bond program, as well as uh, covering you know, part of the cost of a green certification faced by green bond issuer. We are also working closely with uh, universities and organizations such as the IFC to beef up our effort on the capacity building. And we are also in the process of building some common utilities to facilitate climate risk management of financial firms. Obviously, greening the financial system requires collective efforts on all parts of, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, green ecosystem, and market participants can play a critical role here. Today, we have an excellent panel which comprises experts from different parts of the financial world, and they will share the insights in the climate risk management, related opportunities, and also challenges during the green finance journey. So please join me welcome our panel today. Uh, today we have uh, Mr. Victor Cook from Swiss Re. The Swiss Re group is one of the world's leading reinsurers, insurance and other forms of insurance back risk transfer. And Victor is the head of climate markets for property and casualty, basically non-life reinsurance business in Southeast Asia, India, Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan as well. Victor is a risk expert, has extensive ex experience in the insurance industry. 
Our second panelist is Mr. Wai Xin Chen from the HSBC. HSBC Global Research is a leading research house with a strong focus in emerging markets and extensive coverage of ESG factors. Wai Xin is an expert in ESG research. He is now the head of Climate Change Center of Excellence, leading HSBC's global ESG research team. And last but not least, we have Ms. Juliet McCreasy from uh, VE, which is part of the uh, Moody's ESG Solutions. The VG, uh, part of the Moody's corporations, uh, it serves the growing global demand for ESG and climate insights. The group's offerings include ESG scores, climate data, sustainability ratings, and sustain sustainable finance certifier. Juliet is the executive director of the Asia business. And without further ado, uh, let's start our panel discussion today. Uh, the first question that I have is actually for Victor. Uh, Victor, you are coming from the reinsurance, reinsurance world, and obviously, you know, on the asset side of the balance sheet of your of your company, you also need to manage your portfolio. Could you share with us, you know, the Swiss Re strategy in managing climate risk in the investment portfolio? Yeah, sure. Thank, thanks, Daryl. And happy to be here and also happy to have a panel discussion with uh, Julia and Wei Xing. Um, so like I said, Swiss Re is a reinsurance company. Um, so we are also a risk knowledge company. So we look at a, a range of risks. So climate risk is uh, one of them. And at our company, we normally associate climate risk with natural catastrophe. So things like typhoon, flooding, as the world kind of gets become warmer, these are the things that we looked at. Uh, and because that's part of our business to protect our uh, clients. Um, in our company, uh, we have a uh, sustainability ambitions. So by 2030, we have three things that we want to focus on. So climate risk is one of them. And also it looks at energy transition in terms of how we manage the whole flow. The second will be societal resilience. And then the third thing is, re, uh, is on kind of um, how do we make affordable insurance uh, using digital platforms. So these are the topics all linked together. Now, when you talk about, you know, how do we manage the risks in our uh, investment portfolio? So we do have um, um, a kind of sustainability framework. Uh, so if you look at some of the commitments that we have done in the past, uh, so 2017, we have embedded uh, what we call ESG. Uh, criteria in our investment strategy. So how do we sort of look at those uh, according to the criteria we set? And then 2019, um, we kind of moved to Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. So this is the one that we looked at. Uh, how do we get to a carbon neutral investment portfolio by 2050? And then the third thing, which is more recent, uh, is 2021 where we, we kind of co-founded Net Zero Insurance Alliance. Uh, so, and this is the piece from a kind of a reinsurance industry. We look at the underwriting portfolios, get to a kind of a net zero greenhouse um, neutral uh, by 2050. So a lot of things we do is targeting 2030 to 2050. Now, when you look at investment portfolio, so we, we do a um, kind of systematic approach. Uh, so we've got a, a three pillar approach uh, how do we incorporate it in our decision makings every day? So the first thing uh, is enhancement. Uh, second thing is inclusion. And then the third thing you, you can probably tell is uh, exclusion. <laughs> so you include and exclude. Um, so enhancement is really about how we sort of, uh, again, you know, looking at the ESG criteria, looking at our strate uh, strategic asset allocations, the investment portfolio, you know, which one sort of kind of um, qualified to be in it. Um, so now we have 100% of our decisions is, is based on the enhancement criteria where you incorporate the ESG. So that's kind of um, a day-to-day -day things for us already. Uh, inclusion is really about, you know, how do we look at some of the um, pro-climate uh, net zero uh, investment. So there's quite a lot of those in the market these days. Uh, you probably heard about renewable energy, you know, solar panels is some of those, um, and now it's become renewable infrastructure uh, set up. Uh, so we look at those um, set up, and then we will look at the investment according to what they do. 
And then the third piece is relatively straightforward, is how do we exclude some of the stuff? I think the hot topics on you know, coal fire, fossil fuel, uh, it, it is something that we progressively look at. How do we sort of um, uh, control our exposures or, or investment in these areas, right? So, so for example, we um, uh, exclude the 10 most sort of carbon intensive industry in, in our investment portfolio. So we're doing quite a few things. Um, so, but that's all part of the sustainability ambitions that we're trying to get to by 2030. Thanks very much, Victor. Uh, let me turn to Wai Xin. Uh, at COP26, uh, over 450 financial firms pledged to align their assets to net zero. How could they achieve this? And what challenges lie ahead? Is it even possible you know, that uh, they can actually achieve net zero by that time? Thank you, Daryl, for the question. Yes, it is, it is quite challenging. We have to think about the different aspects of the entire industry. I mean, different parts to consider include the underwriting, the, the insurance, reinsurance, lending, banking, asset management, capital markets, uh, retail, and more. And some are easier to do than others, absolutely. But I want to give maybe five points, if I may. The first has definitely got to be awareness and understanding. This might sound quite basic, but uh, it's very important to understand what are we dealing with? It's not just extreme events, but it's also slow onset event. It's not just the, the transition, but it's the economic impact that it will have. So a true understanding of the filtration of these climate risks, both the, the physical and the transition that uh, Peter mentioned earlier, uh, and how that can filter through to the, the economy at large. Next, we have to think about both our own operations. So what are we doing internally? I think we have to get our own house in order first for all financial institutions and thinking about which sectors can we focus on, where can we have the biggest impact, so to speak, and how can we accelerate that transition quickly. And then we use that knowledge and understanding to help our clients in the different areas that they operate. So that is quite important there. One further step would be to setting goals. I think setting goals and actually changing the policies to make that happen. So uh, we, we talked a lot about sort of the net zero alliances. HSBC is a founding member of the net zero uh, banking alliance. And, and we have a target of uh, 750 billion to 1 trillion of uh, sustainable financing towards net zero transition by 2030. So setting goals is important. How we meet those goals is also important. So we need to be mobilizing the capital. How can we do that? How can we help our clients? How can we use our internal assets to do that? That is, that is very important because we need to embed de-risking instruments into that. It's very challenging to ask people to invest in something that they may not know enough about or which carries potentially um, more risk. And so we have to work with uh, our partners, whether it's regulators, other agencies, other uh, peers uh, to, to, to work on how we can de-risk these instruments. At the same time, I think we can't forget the adaptation side of things. It's not uh, enough just to be focusing on the transition risks and how we can decarbonize our economy, but we also have to help our clients prepare for the impacts of climate change, and that is the extreme weather events as well as the slow onset events. So in Southeast Asia, we have a lot of coastal regions, for example, so sea level rises, uh, land degradation, and finally, the challenges you ask. I always get asked this question, Daryl. Thank you for that. The lack of information, as Pratima already mentioned, that is, that is very, very challenging. It's the disclosure that we need to improve on. It's, it's great to have potential initial disclosures from TCFD, as being discussed in this panel. But we need to think about what is the quality of that? Are they consistent? Are they coherent? And a question I always like to ask uh, uh, or tell my clients to ask of their companies are the carbon disclosures a true and accurate reflection of the climate change risks faced by the company? Because they may not be. And what we have to avoid is greenwashing. Thank you, Daryl. Thanks, Weixin. Uh, obviously, you know, the uh, financial firms themselves may not necessarily equip, you know, with the, all the necessary tools, you know, for them to addressing the challenges. And also from the perspective of investors, you know, you, you also should uh, legitimately worry about, you know, greenwashing, you know, what can we do about it? And that actually comes to the question, you know, are there any service providers in the market actually to, would help us to as, help the financial firm, you know, in addressing these challenges? And uh, Juliet, you know, it's time for you to share with us, you know, some uh, of the uh, services that, you know, uh, people like yourself can provide to the market. How, how uh, financial firms can leverage on things like, for example, ESG ratings, uh, in 
facilitating their credit allocation decisions. Uh, how can they do it, you know, on this front? And and how can you explain a bit about the forward-looking nature in those ESG rating, you know, uh, and uh, how you know investors can actually make use of the information contained in those ratings? Yes, thanks a lot uh, for your question. So, it's um, it's as you pointed out, and it was mentioned by the speaker's note as well. The financial uh, institution started to integrate ESG and climate risk into their risk assessment process. This is really important, especially for high transition sectors where the, um, the cost of carbon transition can be really high. It can be, uh, you know, um, involve a higher cost of, uh, and it can in, as well change the debt profile of the, of the corporate. Uh, as well for issuers in operating, uh, operating in real with high physical risk. Uh, they could be um, really uh, have negative impact on their current operating business. So, how we can serve and support our um, organization, finance institution, on that? Exposure to climate risk um, uh, are already taken it into account in our ESG and um, climate risk profile via different different scoring, uh, which has carbon footprint um, score, energy transition score, physical risk score. This is all help us to understand how it will impact at the end the credit profile of the companies. To do that, we need, as uh, we've seen, uh, mentioned, we need to be able to um, understand from the granular information to get the right overall view on the credit worthiness of the companies. So we start always with the uh, more granular information to understand what are the companies are really facing in terms of transition risk and physical risk. So for transition risk, we will request information on, you know, the GHS emission of the company, their involvement in fossil fuel. For physical risk, we'll ask more about, you know, the concentrations of the facilities of the companies in flooding area or water stress or typhoon areas. And, um, and as well, uh, we'll ask more about their climate governance, what we call the climate governance. So, have they read it in terms of disclosure about their alignment to TCFD uh, disclosure, but as well different taxonomy. So by capturing this information, it will already give us an idea on how they are facing, what they are facing in terms of physical risk and transition risk, and how it could impact their credit profile. Then we can assess a second step, which is how a change in climate policy could impact the company. For example, a change in carbon tax. Um, uh, what will be the cost for a company to retrofit some activities? And um, are they, uh, you know, all their facilities uh, concentrated in one specific area? And we've got the example of the Thailand flooding in 2011, you know, that really impacted the profile of companies, the, the financial profile of the company. So when the second step of analysis is done, it will, we can integrate that in, a, in our more overall assessment about the impact of those risk to the credit worthiness of the company. And at the end, the answer, we, the question we want to answer is that is the company able to fund its transitions in the business toward a more, um, yeah, to more, a more less polluting or greener uh, business operation? One of the other key questions that is really important for the financial community to answer, it's uh, more about the, probability, the, di the liability that the company could face because of climate issues. And I'll just take the example of PG&E, uh, uh, which is the first climate uh, bankruptcy, we call it like this, uh, linked to you know, the California wildfire. This company became grand, uh, bankrupt because of the liability due to the, to the wildfire. Uh, so this is really key. And then this is all this information that we, we capture and we try to capture as the best we can. Uh, given the, and I will come back on that, we get on the data issues uh, that we take into account in our ratings today. Then I will come, will come to your question about forward-looking opinion. So forward-looking opinion is a step further where we do analysis not only on identification of the, the risk, but as well stress testing and analysis. So what does it mean for financial institutions? It means that they will have to probably adjust their credit rating and as well project the credit worthiness of the company based on, on, on different you know, climate scenarios. So to do that, 
we, we try to provide, to support our clients with two types of variables. The first one are the climate variables, and the second one are macro financial variables. And both of them have to be combined to create these climate risk scenarios. Of course, when we always start uh, in, in, uh, with um, the regu regulatory parameters, because you need to start somewhere with strong, with common backgrounds. So if we do look a little bit at the climate risk variable we provide, there's two aspects in that. The first one is identification of the, of the climate risk, and the second one is quantify them, how we can measure, quantify and measure them. So I already mentioned some of solution to, uh, you know, identify uh, these this, uh, climate issues. I spoke about, you know, the physical uh, risk data scoring, which is uh, forward-looking data. On, um, on the organization on, uh, on specific hazards. There's as well the transition risk uh, data, which is an assessment on the company ability to reduce its fossil fuels and to uh, leverage on other power uh, energy um, um, and power, uh, uh, other you know, um, technology. And then the climate governance. Uh, the climate governance is more about, you know, um, how the company is able to disclose about this alignment to regulatory, climate regulatory issues, but is the company always forward-looking in terms of um, taking opportunities from this climate change? So this is really on the identification of the, um, identification of the, of the climate risk issues. And then the second part is more on quantification of them. So I mentioned the ma climate um, macroeconomy scenarios that we do provide with an 80 years horizon and where the, as we align our assumption with the NGFS, so the, um, the, the Network for Greening Financials uh, system. Uh, so we use the same assumption that they are using for physical risk and, and, and transition risk. We do also as well provide climate adjusted probability of default for uh, listed companies and unlisted company. Um, and, and then we've, of, we have some um, software and model uh, to transmit this, uh, to translate class, climate pathway scenarios into uh, variables, into financial data that can financial institution use in their um, model liability or asset allocation. So this is a kind of uh, solution that can be tailor-made actually um, but they're all based on the same methodology uh, to support financial organization and corporates. Right. Thank you for the explanation. I think basically, you know, what you need to do is to really understand the business models of the, of the firms, you know, really well and, uh, and to look into the exposure to the uh, climate, different types of climate risk and try to quantify them and, you know, impose certain kind of scenarios and risk stress testing, you know, on, on the firms. And then you, you know, distill all the information and, and come up to the ratings, you know, to facilitate the decisions of financial firms. So uh, obviously, you know, there are actually high degree of uncertainty in the assumptions that we make, you know, in those uh, stress testings or scenario analysis. Obviously, that relies on the expert judgment of scientists, for example, and also the expert judgment of economists about, you know, how the climate transition can impact the macro economy, so on and so forth. So there are, is always an element of you know, uncertainty in the analysis uh, when we come to you know, stress testing these firms. But when we come to the financial firms themselves, can I ask you a follow-up question on that? Um, the financial firms are also asked to conduct a similar scenario analysis and stress testing, which is actually quite different from a firms that are in, you know, in a particular business, for example, power generation. So how, how does it you know, differ from a typical stress test or scenario analysis conducted you know, on a normal business in the case of a financial firm? Can you, you know, give us some tips about how to conduct this, this sort of analysis? Yeah, so maybe in terms of user case of all this, because at the end this is the point, you know, how this financial, the financial institution can use these data and support that. I will say that um, uh, just to take a step back, the key, uh, data which we, which we do provide on physical risk, for example, is um, it's be able to quantify and uh, dimensions risk into scores. So we provide scores 
uh, that on specific um, uh, hazards, so flood, uh, hurricane, typhoon, wildfire, water stress, and so on. And then we, we provide a score based on the um, frequency, severity, and expo exposure in the different region. We just recently released a new data set that is um, as well uh, weighted by populations uh, in all regions and uh, for this specific hazard. So how in lenders or banks can use that? They can really assess their portfolios and properties by location and by hazard. And then we can integrate this data uh, into their own models. Uh, because at the end, you're right, you know, financial institution needs climate models. And they need climate models with a kind of homogeneous um, uh, hypothesis. Uh, so they can use it for, I don't know, their risk department. They can use it for their capital provisioning. They can use it for IFRS 9 disclosure. So, but they need a solid one at the beginning with the same parameters. Uh, that are consistent from whatever they disclose to whatever they, you know, they, they do projection on their clients. I'll just take a really quick example on a solution we provided for a large banking group in, um, who uh, ask our assistants, you know, to develop and conduct stress, te stress testing on their mortgage portfolio in Hong Kong. And so the solution we provided was a mix of, uh, you know, implementation of climate risk adjustment into their credit risk department, but as well physical risk scoring and data um, by location and by hazard in their different banks facilities. And we add uh, the climate scenarios, um, you know, on the, um, for 40 years in this case, um, and uh, to be able, you know, to drive these different scenarios. And of course, it was based because it was Hong Kong, so it was based on HKMA narratives and and and, uh, and regulation requirements. So this is a kind of solution we can provide uh, to financial institutions to help them to support them really in uh, being able to to be compliant with the regulations. And I mentioned earlier what we call the climate governance, uh, which is a new name, but uh, you know to just to encompass all the solutions. Uh, to support that, and this coming from the TCFD alignment, the EU taxonomy, but as well uh, green share assessment or climate controversies. Uh, and this is really showing the diversity of, you know, how physical risk or transition risk can affect a lot of different departments and different way um, of doing business, actually. Uh, so, yeah, this, I, I would probably stop there, but I, I really think it's important to uh, put in perspective these solutions and making sure that it's uh, always improving and as well evolving as well because we've got new solutions and new technology every day that need to be taken into account. Thank you for the uh, further sharing. Uh, why Xin, you know, uh, can I come back to you again on the role of banks? Uh, I think, you know, when we just heard uh, earlier on, you know, when Victor shared about, you know, how uh, Swiss Re, you know, is uh, managing its portfolio and betting the ESG factors in the decisions. He mentioned exclusion that, you know, for some of the really uh, high emission industries, you know, they uh, or certain, you know, uh, 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 types of industry that does not satisfy the green criteria, they may actually consider to exclude them. But, uh, you know, the outcome of having the banks, you know, excluding all the brown industry could be devastating. You know, if you can't do it in one go. So any advice to our banking colleagues, you know, among the audience, you know, what should they do to assist these uh, industries to uh, transition to a uh, net zero uh, target? Thank you, Daryl. Yes, indeed, you can't do it immediately. We wouldn't have an orderly transition in that sense. I mean, the, the first thing I would say is actually have those conversations. I'm always um, somewhat surprised that climate is not in every banking conversation that relationship managers have with their clients. It should be a part of this discussion. It should permeate the thinking in the strategic direction. So that's very, very important. Then it would be a case, especially for these brand companies, as you mentioned, Daryl, of nudging and advising. Sort of, thank you for your thoughts to the client, but what about considering this? Uh, have we considered this climate scenario or this emission scenario as, as uh, as was mentioned by Juliet, how can we embed this into your thinking when we need to provide you with capital solutions? The third thing is, is oft mentioned on this panel is scrutinizing the strategies 
of these companies. That's very important. Are they science-based, as you mentioned? Uh, are they soundly net zero? Do they actually have a vision? And is there a management incentive to actually raise that ambition? Or is it just greenwashing? Uh, to be honest with you, we have to cut through the greenwashing and think about how ambitious these targets are. Brown companies definitely have the potential to transition towards green and greener companies in the future. Do they have the vision and the, the management uh, ability and goal to actually do that? That is very, very important. I think one thing that we have to look at is, is not the immediacy of it, but the momentum. So uh, are these companies making progress on their climate vision, on their transition, on their targets and goals? And are we seeing that uh, disclosed in, a, in an appropriate way? If they are making momentum, I think that's fair. The next question to ask is, how quickly are they making this progress? If year after year we're asking the same questions and there's no progress, we'll have to sort of rethink the relationship there. And then it is up to maybe financial institutions to give some form of incentive and engagement. That can be in, in a variety of different ways. Uh, there is discussion about uh, lowering the, uh, the interest on, on loans, for example, or giving uh, the sustainability linked aspect aspect of it, giving more incentives, should they meet certain sustainability targets, and maybe it's a better rating from Juliet and her team, for example. So how can we give those incentives? But in the end, after all said and done, if there's no momentum, if there's no progress, if there's no incentive, then we have to make some quite tough decisions. But that's a, that's a long process. It's not something that happens immediately. So hopefully it's well thought out, and hopefully it's something that we give our customers and clients enough time to prepare for. Well, obviously, you know, uh, the whole banking community has to work together to uh, to assist their clients, you know, in this green greening journey that uh, going moving towards the net zero. They can come back to you and say that, oh, you know, I don't, I, you don't want to bank with me. I bank with the other bank, you know. So, yeah. so everyone would have to <clears throat> have to have the same target in order to create an effect. Now, allow me to go back to you, Victor. Uh, you, I, you earlier on, I picked your brain, you know, brain, you know, on the investment side. Can 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 I ask you to say a few words, you know, on the underwriting, right, underwriting side? Obviously, the insurers are really the experts of quantifying risk and price risk. And uh, you know, in the area of uh, physical risk, for example, you know, it is actually quite in line with the catastrophe risk that the insurers are looking at. And transition risk, of course, is another you know animal that we, we need to deal with. But for the other parts of the financial community, they are not re really that well equipped, you know, in addressing those risks. Are there any uh, 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 experience that you can share with our audience on this one? Yeah, sure. Um, so there are quite a few things there. So maybe I just touch on the underwriting mm -hmm. and then the solutions. So earlier. You know, talk about you know NACAT and climate change or climate risk for us is kind of tend to lump together. Uh, that's partly because it's, it's what we do. Um, so maybe I'll give you a figure, a couple of figures. So 2019, um, acad economic loss from NACAT events was around 146 billion. So quite big figures. Uh, insure loss was 60, 60 billion. So you probably start the question. Okay, so where? is the, the balance of that, where did they go? So someone has paid for it, I don't know who, um, but not the insurance uh, industry. Now, 2020, the, the two numbers, one of them has increased to 190, and then the, the other one is 90. So you can tell that the numbers in terms of economic loss arising from cat events, whether it's climate change related or not, uh, is there, it's increasing. Uh, insure loss, it's also increasing, but there's a gap. Yeah, so that tells you if you sort of get the underwriting wrong, it's a very expensive business. Uh, so what we do on the underwriting side, I think uh, Julia explained quite a lot on the modeling piece already. Uh, so one piece we do is uh, kind of an in-house cat model. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at all the different trends of the climate change uh, mm -hmm. and then embed it into the model. So that's one thing you know, we do on a regular basis. And that's what we share with our clients as well in terms of what the model tells us in terms of the potential loss and the return period. And then the second thing is uh, how do you kind of prevent it? Now, prevent it, uh, there are a couple of components, right? So first thing is that uh, we have a, a business a sustainability uh, risk framework. So we look at the type of risk, we identify them. Um, 
ESG and climate risk, everything together. And then we look at ways of mitigating them. Uh, and in some cases, if we can el eliminate them, that would be the outcome of that, um, uh, the, the, the framework that we do. So that's one thing. And then the second one will be on um, the solutions that we can offer. So at the end, they, a reinsurance company is all about, so how do we help insurance companies as well as the community? So there are a number of different types of solutions that we currently offer to address this. Uh, so one of them is quite popular, it's called uh, index insurance. I think commonly known as uh, parametric solutions as well. Uh, so this is a relatively straightforward, not indemnity product, uh, but it's looking at the severity of the, uh, the cat events, uh, whether there is the, the amount of rainfall, uh, the flooding, uh, and tied to the claims payment. So it's relatively quick in terms of settlement. So it helps the people to get back to their lives a lot quicker and also to speed up the, um, uh, the entire processing piece. Uh, so we do that quite a bit uh, in uh, Southeast Asia with some of the um, you know, countries where they suffer e event already. Um, the other one, again, Juliet talked quite a bit on that is uh, the analytics. So how do you use all this data? You know, what does it tell you? Uh, and then we provide those data to help the uh, decedents, in our case, the insurance companies or other, um, or for example, bank as well. So what does it tell you about the potential loss that you might see arising from you know, some of these events? Um, and then the third type of solution is mainly um, geared towards the government side. So we call it public sector um, solutions. Um, because insurance companies and governments tend to look at the, 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 the needs quite differently, right? So governments, um, you know, you look at public assets, you look at government assets. Uh, are they protected, for example? Uh, so we design solutions for them as well. Uh, and then the last one is kind of popular in Hong Kong lately is uh, basically uh, insurance link securities. So Hong Kong has launched that um, a few months ago. Uh, so this is basically cap bonds. Uh, basically, how do you solve? Uh, it's, it's a vehicle you transfer the, um, the, exp the natural catastrophe exposure in terms of climate change into capital markets. So Swiss Re is a kind of a pioneer. We've done that many years ago, and uh, we do that quite regularly, advising governments, uh, World Bank or ADB, uh, to help some of the developed countries to kind of manage that. So there's a couple of things that we do and hopefully some of them can help you know, the banks in terms of how, what you do. Now, your last question was more on, you know, ha, you know for example, HSBC, you know, if you don't have those data or, or the, the know-how, what do you do in managing those, right? Um, so I say is these days is through data. You know, data is kind of everywhere these days. You have a lot of data that I don't have and I have a lot of data you don't have. Um, so simple solution is work together. You know, we can come up with partnerships and, and we do that quite a bit. And, you know, the partnership could be in the form of how do we design the product uh, to manage the exposures. Um, best would be using a digital platform uh, because that's kind of the popular thing to do these days. Um, so we do that quite a bit with uh, not just banks, uh, with, you know, other reinsurance company, data company, uh, because a lot of things these days, uh, you can measure things with, uh, with sensory technology as well, right? So yeah. for example, a uh, rainfall, agro, agricultural type business, looking at rainfall, how do you design solutions to, um, to prevent them? So I, I guess, you know, my answer to that would be, you know, look at how we can sort of help each other to come up with solutions to help. Mm. Gather the data and to become data scientists in order to address the issue. Yeah. Now, I, I know we are running out of time, but uh, there are a few questions from the floor, from the submitted by the audience. And, but I, I think I'll just pick one and just to uh, seek a quick feedback from uh, each one of you. So maybe, you know, you can respond by, you know, one or two sentences, you know. And, and I think this is a, a quite relevant one, one. Because, you know, when, when talking about all the green finance goals, they all sound very good, very, you know, that's the right thing to do, etc. Uh, but how can we ensure there's no greenwashing? You know, what we, so can you share with us, you know, in one or two sentences, what you wish to see uh, there are certain arrangements that can actually help us uh, addressing greenwashing. Why, Shin? Thank you. Spoken about greenwashing a lot. I think the, the disclosure and the verification of that information is very important. One of the things that was discussed at COP26 was the overall mitigation 
of Global Emissions, OMGE. It's, it's does this strategy or does this activity truly result in a reduction of emissions globally and the emissions are not leaked or transferred elsewhere? So how can we get the assurance and the verification from the companies that their activities are doing it properly and are not, to be honest with you, just a, a marketing campaign? So the, the scrutiny needs to be there and the scrutiny comes from um, the, the regulators, the, the service providers, the investors, and civil society and the general public. So all of us need to work together, as Victor says, in partnership to, to try and see how accurate these climate disclosures are and where they present the risks going forward and how they can uh, transition towards lower carbon. Victor, what you wish to see, you know, if on, on addressing greenwashing, you know, as an investor, what you wish to see on the front? Well, um... What do I wish to see? Um, so, so for, for our business, I think um, the ESG topic is, is kind of embedded, right? So, so if I just look at the last three months, uh, the number of engagements we have regulators in entire Asia, for example, uh, sustainability topic is on top. So whether it's about framework policy and what do we do, right? Um, so what we'd like to see, I, I think is continue to see that, um, you know, if some of the regulation come through and embedded into requirements for how you manage your business would be the best way of managing it. Um, but it would take some time. Uh, I, I think some of the um, kind of the more developing countries would take a bit longer to get there. But I think ultimately, I would say the, the regulations would be the good starting point. Thank you. Juliet? Yeah, I would say that um Okay, greenwashing it's a big topic and there's a different way. So our role as data provider and uh, service provider is really to bring data and transparency uh, to avoid this greenwashing. So it's our key roles. I will say, uh, but to do that, we need quality underlying data and we need to be have transparency. So one of the points is not how you define, um, you know, uh, the good ESG measures or the good ESG methodology is to be transparent on your methodology so stakeholders can really understand what is going beyond this number and what does it mean. And I will say uh, quickly the second key point for me is to start with a short term commitment. It's great we all our companies all as, as a corporate and all the uh, we've got a flurry of, you know, long-term commitment on the net, net zero deep decarbonization, uh, which is great. But to arrive at and to avoid this, what's happening in these 30 years or 40 years, we need short-term goals. And then for me, the short-term goals that each company will, should, um, will be, should be transparent or it's really the best way uh, to demonstrate their commitment and their willingness to act today, to start today their ESG journey or their transitions. So this short-term goal for me is as much important as the long-term commitment we're seeing. Yeah, thanks. Excellent. Um, I just noticed that, you know, after you know, hearing the views from each of you on this topic, I noticed that uh, we do have a mini green finance ecosystem on the stage today, you know, ranging from <laughs> regulator, investor, insurer, banks, and the service provider. I, and, and I think that is important, you know, to address this, you know, we can't really do it alone, you know, and uh, we need to work together to collaborate, to share the data, and also to, you know, uh, you, uh, share, you know, the analytical tools available uh, in addressing that. And, um, and uh, clim climate related risks obviously are affecting uh, all sectors of the financial ecosystem. And, um, and uh, it's important that uh, we, we actually share the, those insights in addressing the challenge. And also, there are actually op new opportunities arising, you know, in the financial world. Obviously, you know, to finance transition in particular, uh, there's a huge uh, financing needs arising, you know, from transition. And that actually represents, you know, a, a good opportunity for the banks and for the investors to, uh, to take part in the transition process. Now, let me uh, thank the uh, excellent panel uh, panelists, you know, for, for the today's uh, discussion. And I think, you know, we, we do have a very meaningful exchange here today. And I hope, you know, that sort of conversation can continue. Thank you again. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, everyone, for joining the Climate Risk in Action, a conversation with practitioners today. We hope you all find today's roundtable insightful. There will be an email sent to each of you with a feedback form. Your suggestion will be carefully considered and highly valuable for us to plan the future events of the Alliance. 
thank you and have a good day.